A while back we did a Scyther run, and in case you want to check that out and don't want to get spoiled, let's just say that it's not the best run I've ever done, but it did get the old gears turning in my head. I already do cross-gen runs, so why don't we start to add in some of the new evolutions or branches of Pokemon that exist already in Generation 1. And those two things are how we get today's video. Scizor is a very cool Pokemon, and I don't really need any other reason to do the run, and I could just end the intro right here, but I will say that I don't know when Scott will release the Parasect race video so I'm hoping that this video will be around that time and my current plan is to do a few bug type videos that either start or end with that run but we'll see how it goes if not who cares now if you want to know how I do these runs the website is called Sanqui so google that or ask in the comments anyway and I'll think you're joking and I'll just answer sarcastically but the rules for the run are also in the description and I'd also just like to quickly say that I do Pokemon solo run content often and if that is of interest rest to you feel free to subscribe to be kept up to date likes and comments help me out the most and whether you are a returning subscriber like peanut or someone new that wants to know how they can help out just scroll down and type in clamps because even though i haven't watched futurama in seven years i still think about clamps sometimes and i can't stop myself from making dated cartoon references i'd also like to gauge some interest here so let me know now when you randomize a rom professor oak gives you a random pokemon for example since i'm doing a gen 1 and 2 rom this week I randomly got Yanma, but next week we'll likely do Butterfree, so if you guys want to guess the random Pokemon, do so in the next few days of this video's release, and I'll do my best to feature the lucky person that maybe hit that 1 out of 151 odds in the next video. And with that out of the way, sit back, relax, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's just dive into it. Just like from the Palkia video, I figured out GameShark codes work for perfect DVs, and I have them in effect for this video from the start. Now there are some slight issues I found from this, but we'll go over my thoughts on that later. But for this video, the name will be Clamps because I love Futurama, and even though I haven't watched it in forever, I still remember Clamps vividly. So Scizor has an extremely easy early game, and there's not much to really say, so let's go over a few things. Now first up is that I'm trying white lettering on the stats here, now it's likely not permanent it, but I would like your thoughts on it, especially if you like it, but I thought I would just try it out. More than likely, we're going to go back to the black lettering. The overlay is essentially the same, but there's just some more readability and some small things, so let me know. As for Scizor, it's got some interesting things going for it. Along with only having the one double weakness to fire, it has a ton of resistances, and it sports a massive 130 base attack with some overall pretty solid stats. 445 base stat total would put it at 13th overall in the original 150 51 and its weakest stat of 65 speed it's not great but it's serviceable and it's in that range where it won't really be an issue as if it had something like 40 speed as far as movesets go I didn't respect bullet punch until I did the script and did some research now I thought of it as a steel version of tackle but when doing research through editing and post-production it turns out that it's actually the steel clone of quick attack which means it gets increased priority and it's a little better than I thought I also have the previously mentioned quick attack to supplement my PP usage or to finish off things that barely survive. I also have Leer to soften up more tough opponents, and then there's Focus Energy. I don't think this ROM fixes it, so it's just bad. It's broken. Now digging a little bit deeper on the learn set, Scizor is a bit of a late bloomer. You hit a minor power spike in the late 20s, but most of your strongest moves are going to come at the, near the end of the game pretty much, and you'll notice the TM section being a little sparse, and that's because Scyther doesn't get any help in terms of coverage outside of what it learns naturally. We'll get into more detail on that later, but I thought I'd cover some of this up front while I stomp through this early game. And I'll keep it as short as I can, but I will say that even though I could beat Brock at minimum battles, I have done a really quick test run just to see what Scizor can learn, and I know that things are going to get a little tough, so I do battle everything leading up to Brock, with one exception, and that's the Light Years Junior Trainer. In this version, both of his Pokemon have Sand Attack, and it's just got a lot of potential to be very frustrating and awful, so it's not worth the hassle. As far as Brock 
goes, bullet punch, just eats him for lunch, and this one is over very quickly. There's no hassle here. On the way to Cerulean, I will say that I battled a lot of extra trainers to prepare for the next part of the game, but I'd like to say that it's really great to have a steel move because trainers with these new fairy typing like Jigglypuff and Clefairy, they're normally something that you would skip 99% of the time because they are just kind of bulky and they can put you to sleep, but they become easy one shots for free experience, and I enjoyed this part more, probably more than I should have. Now let's take a look at rival number two, and the age old question for this fight like always is that, are you going to get hit with sand attack? And today, we don't. I use Leer and I soften the bird up, and after taking some resisted damage, I finally take it out. Now from there, this one is in the bag. I will say that you cannot pick the starter that you are against, and Charmander with Dragon Rage this early in the game is just one of the worst experiences ever, and it only gets even worse because we're times too weak to fire, but it is what it is, we get through this battle. At the end of the fight, I hit level 17, and I get access to agility. It's not the best move for badge boosting, and Swords Dance will be much better later in the game, but this move is critical for now, and we'll talk about it more very soon. Going towards Bill's house, once again, I'm going to call attention to the fact that I'm battling a lot of extra trainers here as well. For the most part, they don't take too much time, but I have done quite a few up to this point, and since this is my first full run, it's something to look back on when we are thinking about maybe optimizing the game. So what's the purpose of all these extra levels, and why have I felt the need to grind? Well, my friends, Misty's already not great, but the Sanqui version of Misty is nightmarish. The Star U isn't too bad, but the idea here is that I have agility, I'm going to utilize it to outspeed and get a few attack badge boosts just to make myself stronger, and here I get chunked, I'm at about half health going into the Star Me. And you can see here I'm not doing a ton of damage, and I already suffered so much damage earlier that a Bubble Beam crit takes me out, and that's the first reset of the run. I have one more reset, and the thing that makes Misty so rough here is that her Star Me, the Star Me in the second gem of the game, has Hydro Pump, guys. Now imagine a Pokemon this fast with this high of a special having access to this stabbed nuke when you don't really have any answers for it, and that's kind of what we have going on here. Now fortunately for us, my extra levels do help, and I'm able to narrowly get by on the next attempt utilizing the same strategy that we've been over, but overall, this one is more luck based than anything, and you just kind of hope you don't see a crit or maybe a hydro pump, but we'll see if the extra battles were worth it in the end. Moving towards the SSN, there's no body slam today, but I do battle the gentleman with a fire type to get that rare candy, and I guess maybe I got lucky here, but they just don't use any fire type moves and we don't get to see that struggle just yet, and we can quickly skim over rival number three after that. I did learn Metal Claw at level 21, and it's an upgrade over Bullet Punch. And once again, I avoid Sand Attack, and I'm just poised to cruise through this fight. And that's until I hit some bad luck, fellas. Kadabra uses a double resisted confusion on me, and of course I get confused. Now without going into too much detail, when you hit yourself with confusion, it's like you are doing an attack against yourself. That's the equivalent of a 40 base power topless physical move, and with 130 base attack, it adds up pretty quick. I end up hurting myself three times in a row, and that's very unlucky, and I don't get to move on to the end of the fight until I'm at just 4 HP, and even though everything Ivysaur has is resisted, I'm just too low, and that's honestly a pretty surprising reset. Now, needless to say, this fight isn't that hard. Outside of getting sand attack multiple times, it's nearly unlosable, and outside of some of the worst coin flip luck you could possibly have, the previous scenario will not repeat itself even if you did this battle like 100 times. But this being the first playthrough, all I can do is just kind of take note and move forward. Now let's take a look at Surge, and it's worth noting that electric types are one of the few toppings that resist steel, and just like with Misty, we're going to have to rely on quick attack here. I make a blunder here and I forget to heal, but the idea is that Thunderbolt's going to be awful, so let's go ahead and set up a little bit of attack badge boost to give myself a better chance. But on the Voltorb, I kind of chicken out because I'm worried that maybe it has Sonic Boost but eventually I progress through his first two Pokemon. The Raichu ends up not going for any Thunderbolts, and I'm not punished for failing to heal, and I'm able to chip it down while tanking some Thundershocks for another badge. Now we can skip all the way past Rock Tunnel, and before I get to Celadon, I'd like to point out that 99.9% .9 of runs, you're going to be battling the Shakespearean suit wearing gambler with the fire tops, but it feels good just like earlier to be able to beat up on these fairy tops, like this convenient double Clefairy trainer here, and it's 
much preferable to chancing that double super effective fire damage. From there, it's time for the rocket hideout, and I do the usual pickups of high money items, and in case you were wondering, I do believe that Scizor can learn double edge, but I just wasn't a big fan of the recoil damage, so I opted to skip it for my runs today. As for Giovanni, it's a snoozer of a battle. Steel moves against his rock types makes for a very fast battle, but I will give a shout out to the Sanqui Kangaskhan. The way I have the special stats set up to use the highest of the generation 6 special attack or defense makes it an absurdly tanky Pokemon, but it's not an issue today. Now with a double resistance to grass, Erica is the next obvious choice. Now this isn't going to be exactly like the Charizard run with that situation where I battled the first last, but here I do get paralyzed and now my thought process here was that I'm tanky, I'm out of paralyzed heals and I can just kind of brute force my way through it because I don't want to use that full restore and let's see what happens. Well my friends, we get a battle today that's even longer than that wrap down in the Charizard video and I would say if I wasn't playing at the increased speed that I do, this one would have lasted roughly in the upper four minute range, maybe three, four minutes. And the sad thing about this one is that I actually won in the end, so that's about 4 minutes of in-game time and that's a pretty hefty price to pay in such a single insignificant battle for the final time. And I end up using the full restore anyway, and that's kind of annoying, but remember this is a first playthrough and we can just kind of correct little things like this on the next playthrough. I'm just wondering when I'm actually going to take these trainers seriously, and all I can say is maybe next episode guys. So as far as Erica goes, I do have Slash now. But I'm kind of running low on PP, and like I said earlier, I double resist grass moves, I resist normal moves, so overall this one is pretty short and sweet, but even before I tested this run, I knew that this would be one of the easiest fights in the game. Now speaking of easy, I will be skipping over Pokemon Tower today, with Slash and very high physical damage, everything is essentially a one shot, and we just don't have to dwell on this section. Now from there, I can head down to Fuchsia, and after getting the final HMs of the run, and some more high money items, it's time for our big buy of the run. The one key thing I identified for testing was that try attack is absolutely key for a couple of fights, but we'll get into that in a bit. Outside of that, let's talk about a problem I noticed for setting my DVs in these Sanqui ROMs with the Game Shark. For some reason with this ROM, it either messes up your special stat experience completely, or it just maxes it out from the start, but it's hard to really test unless you put it in the dissection tool and looked at it. Now I test this a few times and only calcium seemed to not work on pretty much no matter what Pokemon I'm using and there's not much I can do unless I want to have an imperfect run but I'm just going to keep it as is for now. Outside of that I buy enough protein so that I'll eventually max it out and I go with HP ups for my second stat since I can't use calciums. I make a mistake by selling the two HP ups I get for free so I did waste a good bit of money but we can amend that on the next run. From there I opt to go ahead and fight Koga first. I figured it would be really easy and save some backtracking later. With Slash, I can just slice through these trainers pretty easy. And then I thought, well, I'm going to need extra levels later anyway, so why not just grind a little bit? Since I have such high attack, and I was very wrong, my friends. This Sand Slash right here caused me a ton of problems. Even though ground moves are only neutral here, I'm in a range where two digs could knock me out, and I think if I would have went straight Slash, I would have won, but I was trying to preserve some PP, and it ended up costing me another unexpected reset. Now let's move on. As for Koga, I don't have any super effective answers here, but I can still chunk all of his Pokemon and the fact that I resist normal moves means that the Sanquid tool adding explosion to more of his Pokemon means that I have a higher chance of just kind of speeding up the battle without taking a lot of damage, but it's still a little bit slow and overall it's still a first turn victory and we don't really need to go into it. Next up is Silphco and outside of going up to the 10th floor, it's straight to what's really important and that's the huge huge power spike of Swords Dance. Now what's better than 130 base attack? What about the ability to essentially multiply that times 4? Now here I also learned Try Attack. I contemplated on using a moveset where maybe I use Agility and Swords Dance for the late game and while it's tempting to test, I do just go ahead and get rid of it. And let's just look ahead at rival number 5. In this battle, I want you to think of essentially Machamp with Swords Dance and that's how strong we're going to be. First up is Pidgeot and I almost get to freely set up here. I take a little teeny tiny bit of damage before I one shot it with our newfound Super Saiyan levels of attack. Gyarados is up next and this is one of the key reasons for Tri-Attack. There's very few Pokemon that resist the late game
same core of an X scissor and iron head, but water and flying topping is one of those tops and I need this neutral damage really bad, but we'll revisit this later. Growlithe is next and fire is another top that resists both of those moves, but we have tri-attack, let's keep moving. Alakazam is next, I double resist psychic, so you guys already know where this is headed. As for Venusaur, Scizor is almost tailor made to demolish this Pokemon and overall it's just a clean sweep and that feels great. And speaking of bug moves, we get access to something that I wish we got to see earlier and that's the 80 base power stabbed bug move X Scissor. And this move is just really exceptional and it's just something you really don't see in the base generation 1 games. Now as for rival number 5, it was very easy with Swords Dance and that's something to consider when you're thinking about rerouting and changing things around for the next run. Now normally I would say let's skip over Giovanni number 2, but something magical happens today. The Nidorino and even the Kangaskhan just aren't a problem, and for once in its life, the Rhydon steps up to the plate, and we pushed him to the edge, guys. He's not gonna take it anymore. It has an updated move in Rock Blast. It's essentially the Rock Barrage, but it hits twice, and it does some heavy damage before it finally goes down. Now here I'm just kind of praying maybe I can squeak by on the Nidal Queen, but two Metal Claws can't finish the job, and two Double Kicks are enough to force a reset, and this is yet another reset on a battle that I didn't expect, and this run has kind of been full of them. On the next attempt, I just use Swords Dance and we can just burn everything down in one shot. It's little battles like these that I kind of underestimate, but we'll learn from our mistakes. Now ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on the channel, we get to see what a very powerful bug move will do against Sabrina, and for this one, I set up a little baby bit just to be safe, and then I let it rip. Now obviously the pure psychic types are going to be murdered today, but remember that Mr. Mime is half fairy, it resists bug, so it's going to be neutral overall, and that Venomoth's poison topping isn't weak to bug in the updated topping as well, so I do have to use different moves for those Pokemon, but this one is very fast, we don't need to go into it, it's a massacre. And friends, as I take my weekly brisk swim down to Cinnabar, we need to mentally prepare for Uncle Blaine. In testing, I honestly had no idea how to deal with this fight, and it's going to be an interesting experience for us all. There's no point in trying to fight a bunch of fire trainers with unknown movesets, so it's straight to a little bit of Tombstoner, brother! Before we begin today's nightmare. And guys, if this was your standard mom and dad's red and blue, we would be great since Growlithe is just awful, but here it knows Flamethrower. If it uses it on turn one or any turn, it's an instant reset. Here on the first attempt, I get lucky. Tri Attack cannot one shot it, but it does go for a super potion, which is the Blaine special, and we can just move on. And guys, this is not a very common occurrence, I promise you that. And I really want you to soak in how much damage right here this single tick of a fire spin from Ponyta does. This is one of the reasons I think special might be busted with the Sanqui ROMs and Game Shark codes, but I don't know, I can't say that for sure. It's just impressive damage. Maybe I'm just in denial. From there, it's time to experiment with rare candies. I go to level 47 and I get the chance to learn Night Slash, and just like the name suggests, it's Slash, but it's the dark type variety, and I don't think there's any room for it in the moveset, although it's cool. At level 47, we can indeed one-shot the Growlithe now with a Tri-Attack, and you would think that the problems would be solved, but not so fast, my friends. Even though we can one-shot the Ponyta, it's always the final Pokemon that give the most trouble, even if it's a neutral matchup. But here, I can't one-shot the Rapidash, and it knows Fire Blast, and I would calculate how much damage this actually does, but suffice it to say, it's probably enough to kill about 5 scissors at full health. The next attempt I tried a slightly lower level to see if I maybe I can hit a little luck here, maybe set up a swords dance, but we see a flamethrower and that's another reset. I go to level 48 for the next attempt and I thought I had this one in the bag. I get swords dance off, Blaine goes for a super potion, and from there I'm able to easily one shot the next couple of Pokemon with Tri-Attack, including the Rapidash, and now we get to see Arcanine for the first time. Predictably, this thick little puppy needs more than one swords dance and it doesn't miss its fire blast and and that's another painful reset. I fell one more time to a Growlithe Flamethrower, and after that, I use almost all of my rare candies to get to level 51, and we do get access to Iron Head. It's another great 80 base power stab move along with X Scissor, 
Earth, and that really makes our damage absurd, but unfortunately, it is resisted by Fire Type, so it's not gonna help out here. And at level 51, we get good luck on Growlithe. I'm able to get one Swords Dance off, and from there, I hit the threshold to finally be able to clean sweep, and there's not really much more to say about it, but this one was awful, and around level 50-ish is that break point where you can one-shot the Arcanine with one boost. Now, as for what level you would need to be able to survive a flamethrower, I don't know. I'm not willing to spend an hour grinding to figure that out today. But this one's just awful, and even now during editing, I'm just not sure how to balance this one out considering speed and consistency. I just don't know. Now we can finish up the gym portion of the game, and once again, Rhyhorn is out for blood. Rock Blast pelts me down below half health after I set up a little bit, and even though it might look like a very scary situation, the boost along with either super effective damage or neutral damage of Iron Head is enough to clean sweep this fight, and we can very quickly move on once again. Next up is rival number six, and at this point in the run, we are essentially at our maximum power, so let's see how it goes. Pidgeot is first, and you already know, I want to fully set up here. The neutral damage does start to add up, but I do manage to get all of my Swords Dance set up, everything's online, and even though this one looks a little bit scary, I'm getting a little bit low, it's very similar to the Giovanni fight that we just saw. From there, it's a very quick and very easy clean sweep, and for what I think is one of the first times in my solo runs, we are essentially going to condense the rest of this battle into one little quick clip. I just have decent answers, and I have Tri-Attack to thank for that, because I'm not sure the Gyarados would go down to a resisted move, even if I had the max boost. From there, I only have a couple of rare candies left, and I do pick up the one from Victory Road, and there's not much to talk about at this point. There's maybe one more potential problem ahead that I can see, but in my opinion, the worst challenge is over with, and it shouldn't be too bad. Now let's get to the Elite Four, and Lorelei is up. I think you guys could probably guess the strategy at this point, but the water and ice typing of the majority of her team are going to take neutral damage from Iron Head, and couple that with Swords Dance, and then you got X Scissor for the slow bro. Everything should just be really quick, very short, very easy. And things actually work out exactly like that for once in my life. I do mess up and use the wrong move on the slow bro, but outside of that, it's really clean and we don't have to go any deeper in this fight. Now, who's ready for Sanqui Bruno? It's like regular Bruno with a little bit of a kick. So let's see if this steel type ends up like Dialga. Now on the Onyx, I'm being fast, I'm being loose, I'm not paying attention. I just want to set up and get things done and things are fine until the rock slide crits. And we've seen this scenario a few times in the last few battles. And generally after you set up, you can just brute force your way through the fight, but let's see what happens. Now it's a clean sweep for the next three Pokemon and I'm already kind of thinking ahead to Agatha, but Machamp has other plans. I get the very unfortunate 12% chance of critting, which means that I don't actually one shot it and this low kick does an obscene amount of damage since I have a screech debuff on me and that ends the attempt and I lost to Bruno once again and there goes my self esteem. On the next attempt I don't get hit with screech but I also don't crit and this battle goes the way the good lord intended and we can move on and not talk about Bruno until next week I guess. Next up is Agatha and I use a rare candy here even though I'm not sure really why. I guess I wanted to maintain the speed from the boost but the plan is always just the same here. Our clampy boy has one setting and that Swords Dance into Clamp. I think the quick withdrawal from Gengar to Golbat helped me out due to getting a free turn to set up. And since her Pokemon are notoriously defensively frail, I figured who cares about the speed and I just kind of went for it. It turns out to be the correct call. And once again, we have a condensed battle that ends in a montage of Iron Heads. The main thing that I learned here is that you don't need to use a candy on Agatha and it's likely a waste of time. Finally up is Lance and I use my final two rare candies here to get up to level 60 and let's take a deep breath and once again prepare for a run that doesn't have a great answer for Gyarados. Now right from the get-go I need to set up but you can see that Hydro Pump doesn't really do a ton of damage so you would think that this one's not too bad but Gyarados loves the crit and that just makes me have to pull the trigger on setting up a little bit earlier and even though I can one-shot it from here I'm just so low that pretty much anything can take me out. Now with two boosts I can easily take out the two Dragonairs but when it comes down to Aerodactyl it's very fast and I'm just too low to hang into the fight. Now the next attempt is nearly the same. I get a blessing from a hydro pump miss but I squander my gift by going for another setup turn and once again I get crit and I'm pretty much in the same exact situation as last time but the one key difference here is that I have an extra boost and can you guys guess what happens from here? And if you guessed an iron head sweep despite being low then you win nothing but that's what happens and honestly this fight wasn't as bad as I thought even though I was really worried about it at first.
finally up is the champion fight. The previous two rival fights have been really easy, so is this one gonna be the same? First up is Pidgeot, and you guys know the order of business here. I need to set up. I get two sword stance off before it hits a sky attack for really nice damage. I do fully get set up just in time to avoid the second impending sky attack and we can just move it on. And guys, if we've learned one thing from today's video, it's that we can go ahead and pick up the broom because if Scizor is allowed to set up, it's a clean sweep, baby. And I take this battle with ease and that's the run over with. And that's it, Scizor has done it. I was definitely glad I got to see some of these new moves in the run and it was very interesting interesting, but first, let's see how it actually did before we go any further. Scizor finishes this run with a level of 62, 12 resets, and with a final in-game time of 3 hours and 9 minutes. Now up front, I can tell you guys that I feel like I left a lot on the table, and I think I can do better, so let's optimize. But first, let's take a look at Mewtwo. X Scissor and Double Resisting Psychic means that Mewtwo is in some real trouble today. I do one Swords Dance just to be safe, and then I one-shot it, and there's zero trouble, no resets here today. But for science, just for everybody else and for myself, I did go ahead to see if maybe a single X scissor with no setup could do the job, and it does. And all that really does is confirm that we really needed strong bug type moves in generation 1. Now as for the optimizations go, there's quite a few, and I learned a lot of things from my first playthrough. The first thing to save some time was to cut out a lot of battles. I had a very bloated early game leading up to Misty, and no doubt that cost me a significant amount of time. This will have some trade-offs, but we'll go over that soon. I don't do minimum battles exactly, and some of the things like the very quick fairy types or maybe the optional hiker with the onyx are still things that I think are very beneficial because they just barely take any time. And overall, I still cut out a lot of battles and a lot of time in this segment alone. The trade-off here is that I'm a lower level and my experience is set up to where after Staryu, I'll level up and I don't want that because I want to set up. So I do use a rare candy to get to 21, before Misty, and let's just talk about that for a second. Here, I had the most horrendous luck, and there's no two ways about it. Where I was level 22 and only had two resets on my initial run, this time I was only one level lower, but I have seven total resets here, and a lot of that's due to bad crit luck, bad hydro pump luck, and it's not a great fight, but we did make this part faster overall despite the extra resets, and I'm not too worried about amending the resets on these non-tier ranked Sanqui runs. Runs. If I really wanted to, I could just keep trying to run over and over and over until I have no resets. But as someone who does this as a hobby, I'm not going to burn myself out just to have a zero reset scissor run. Sorry. Up to Erica, I didn't have a single reset outside of one at Surge, but instead of battling every trainer inside of Erica's gym, I prioritize just battling the beauties since they give a ton of money and I can kind of make that compromise between cutting out battles and not sacrificing my vitamins later. And remember on the first run, I had that four minute in-game time battle where I was paralyzed. So this little segment right here, along with being more cognizant of my status conditions and cutting out other battles in general, it saved me perhaps the most time of the run, which is kind of sad if you think about it. Now I swear I'm done losing time in this part and I'm gonna do better. I'm putting my foot down guys, I'm gonna do better. Next up is probably the last big adjustment for the run. And because rival number five was so easy after Koga, I thought maybe if I went to Silph Co first, and I got Swords Dance, it would just speed up the game a little bit because Koga was a little bit slower on the first run and this should remedy that. And overall, it just turns into a better route and everything's just a little bit more clean. As for Blaine, I'm gonna save you guys the trouble. I get awful luck just like with Misty and I rack up seven more resets here alone, but the strategy is essentially the same as before. I just use more candies here to make up the difference in my level since I didn't need that Agatha candy from the previous run. There's not much to say here except that this fight isn't great and I gave up on trying to find something that works for consistency. Now if the game corner wasn't so slow, maybe if you had substitute to survive multiple flamethrower turns and you could just kind of fish for that Blaine super potion turn, that might work, but it's just simply too slow. But that's about the only thing I could think of that maybe could make this fight consistent-ish. Now with the hardest battle down, I clean sweep the rest of the game all the way up to Lance, but with how the first run went, I really wasn't worried about it too much and that's why I was comfortable getting to this point three levels earlier than last time and I actually beat this fight on the first attempt. And will the streak continue on the champion fellas? The answer is yes it will. Scizor's late game is just phenomenal and overall I was very pleased with this run outside of two areas. So how did this run do compared to the last one? 
Well, despite resetting seven times each on both Misty and Blaine, I only have a couple of more resets, and I have an overall lower level of 59, but more importantly, the most important thing is I was able to shave off nearly 20 minutes of in-game time for a fairly respectable time of 2 hours and 50 minutes. Now, I don't think this run really gets too much better. Outside of getting lucky on some resets, I don't see how you can do anything other than be at the mercy of the, the Poke Gods for both Misty and and Blaine. Now it's a shame that Scyther can't get something like Rock Slide, Earthquake, or even the updated nerfed version of Dig for Blaine, but considering what Scyther's learn set was, I consider this a massive upgrade, and I had a great time using actual powerful bug moves in Generation 1. So guys, I've been making a real conscious effort to cut down on my intro and outro time, I've been paying attention to the analytics, and I'm trying to make this an overall more pleasing experience for you guys, so all you need to know is that next week, We'll probably continue with Butterfree and maybe one more bug run after that. But that's about all I have for you guys. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. And as usual, give me any feedback, any suggestions you have. And we'll probably see some new stuff going on with my overlay next week. But I'll see you guys then. Bye.